All right. I'm still kind of arriving and getting used to the headgear. So, um, <laughs> anyway, a warm welcome. When the Buddha, oh, sorry, it's not on. I told you I was getting used to it. Okay, is that all right? I'm worried it's too loud because you can hear my breathing, but never mind. It's good to know it's still on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll try not to die. If you stop hearing my breathing, then yeah, it's a safeguard for, for me anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a smaller group today. And uh, I have to admit, when I walked in, this teaching of the Buddha, this phrase that the Buddha used came to mind because one time he gave um, his monks and nuns, actually it only says monks, but it uh, could have been both. It's probably the monks. He gave them some reflections on the repulsive nature of the body. And uh, they were supposed to do this just to come to a balanced perspective of, you know, what this body is. But they took it too far and they all committed suicide. <laughs> yeah, this is in the suttas. And, um, and then the Buddha came back and he said, why is the sangha so diminished? <laughs> and when I came in this morning, I thought, hmm, <laughs> why is the sangha so diminished? <laughs> but I'm sure that's not the reason. I'm sure it's a very beautiful reason. <laughs> and uh, well done to the ones who are here. It's great to have you. And today is the final day of the New Year retreat, even though it's not quite your New Year. But uh it's a beautiful occasion to celebrate the ending of things and perhaps, you know, the birth of something new arising in your life, whatever that may be. So uh, I really enjoy the last day. I feel like I'm just getting into it. Um, but unfortunately, then it's time to go home. But uh, yeah, for those who have made it this far, hopefully today, you know, you can really make use of the opportunity that's still there. And um, yeah, just take this opportunity to really nourish yourselves. So again, whatever's offered is optional, it's an invitation, it's not a must. The schedule can be adapted, and it will be adapted actually, I'd better say that for the sake of the Zoomies as well, um, because today we'll probably invite people to write on a little bit of paper um, something that they'd like to let go of for the new year and something that they'd like to bring forward or bring forth some quality, some behavior, whatever it might be, even a new hobby or whatever it is. Um, and just write that in a couple of words, you know, just a few words on a piece of paper. And then um, we'll start the Q&A session at 3.15 instead of 3.30. So for the sake of the Zoomies as well. And uh, that'll be a bit shorter, maybe half an hour. Then we'll have 15 minutes where we read through those um, wishes and it's really nice for other people to hear your ideas it gives us more ideas and uh yeah and hopefully that will kind of boost us all in in uh being able to really find ways to bring those beautiful qualities forth so that's the main difference today plus maybe i'll just say it now that um we'll end the day with a, a, a guided meta and also some chanting but after that, we have some special chanting for a couple of people here. And it's going to be a mystery until it happens. But it's a very special occasion for a couple of people here. So I'm going to do a special loving kindness chant that everybody is very much welcome to join in with, whether or not you know the words. But I think it will be very supportive if we can all do that together. And it will be a joyful way to end. So before we get to that, today is getting towards the end of the sutta that we began with, which was the Upanissa Sutta. Where is it? Uh, yes. From the Samyutta Nikaya number 12, about the proximate causes and this wonderful sequence that goes all the way from suffering right through to full liberation. And yesterday we got to the point of deep meditation, samadhi. And uh, I just touched a little bit on how that can help um, to generate, in a sense, or to uh, facilitate deeper insights into the nature of things as they really are, yata, bhuta, jnana, dasana. And uh, in uh, another sutta, which is very similar, uh, Anguttara 10, number two, it's called volition. We talked about how this sequence is very natural. There's no need to make uh, an effort for uh, the subsequent um, unfoldings of the path to happen because it really is 
um, causally arisen. And uh, from that happiness, it's inevitable in a sense, if it's the right happiness that comes from within, it's inevitable that our minds will become still, will become resourced. And a mind that is still and resourced is very blissful, mainly because those hindrances have vanished, temporarily at least. So we don't have um, those unwholesome roots of greed and, and irritation arising at all for that period of time. So our lens, if you like, is very clear and we can see more deeply into the way things are. And that is the purpose and benefit of the deep meditation. The purpose is to see deeply into the nature of things. It's not enough just to stop there. Um, and you won't just stop there, especially if you've heard these teachings, as we shall discuss further. So um, we started this retreat by focusing a lot on virtue and the happiness that can be developed through living an ethical life, um, through having positive attitudes to life, positive ways of thinking and regarding one another, thinking about ourselves, thinking about other people. And the Buddha always um, recommended that we do this in public and in private, which is very beautiful because sometimes we can meet a person and we can maybe have certain uh, behaviors on the outside, but internally we might have a different attitude or different thoughts going through our mind. So we're trying to align these things. And uh, if you are irritated with somebody, uh, and you work on that in your own private time, you try to look at the person or the behavior from a different angle, then when you meet the person, you're less likely to uh, say um, irritated words or words that may hurt or harm the other person. So we try to bring these qualities into our mind as well, and that's an aspect of what we call sense restraint or guarding the senses. And of course, um, confidence in the Buddha's teachings arises simultaneously, really, because we start to see that this really has an effect, a very positive effect in our life. We start to feel more happiness. We start to feel, um, really, we get a lot of good friends because people feel safe with us. They feel they can trust us. You know, when you know that somebody tells you the truth, that you can trust that the way they behave in public is the way they really are, then a sense of... Um, ease can, can set in around being with that person. You can really feel safe in their presence. They're not trying to trick you or deceive you in any way. And uh, the Buddha said, you know, for a virtuous person, even the devas, the, the heavenly beings, the invisible beings, uh, protect you. They rejoice. They, um, and animals as well, right? You can really see this in the animal world. I had um, a six-month retreat in, in Australia. Uh, it was actually only last year. It feels like a lifetime ago. Um, it ended up being a four-month retreat, really, because a lot of business kind of intruded on the retreat. Uh, we had to basically reorganize Ajahn Brahm's uh, nine-day retreat to be online. We had people coming from all over the world, 80 people. They booked their flights, and suddenly the venue closed. <laughs> and that news came to me in my retreat. So from 12 hours meditation a day, it was 12 hours working online trying to reorganize the retreat. But until that time, I was really in the most fantastic conditions in a little kuti. Uh, that means a meditation dwelling, but it had you know, a bed, it had everything it needed, uh, I needed. It had a desk, it had a bed, it had my sleeping bag because it was zero degrees a lot of the time. It had a walking path and it even had a shower. Most of them don't have showers inside, so I could be completely secluded. And uh, the only company I had, other than an interview with Ajahn Brahm once a week, who would come down to that place with a chaperone and give me an interview, other than him, my company was the kangaroos and the magpies as well. There were six beautiful, no, sorry, five beautiful magpies, which I named, and they would always turn up wherever I ate my food. I'd go and get my food from a little... Um, kind of box that somebody had actually made, especially on legs at the top of this hill. And they'd raise a little orange flag when the food was in there. So I could sort of hide behind the bushes. I wouldn't even have to see them. But sometimes I spied them coming and I just felt so much better that these people had put my food together and I'd just go and get the food. And then I'd sit somewhere in this 300 acres of bush to have my food. I had a few spots that were my favorites. And those magpies would turn up every time. And they were so polite. <laughs> they'd be on the tree and, you know, if I looked at them, they'd go, I'm not looking, I'm not watching. <laughs> they were so polite, it was amazing. And it was only after I 
put the food out in small pieces at the end of my meal and then made a whistling sound that they'd start to come. And they were so sweet and uh, always in the same order. So they were my friends, but also the kangaroos. And uh, one time I came back to the kuti after probably being going out to collect my food and uh, all these different kangaroo families were around the, my residence, my kuti. And uh, I thought, oh, it will be impossible to get back to the kuti um, without disturbing them. They're bound to run away. And they all did hop away, except one family, who were my favourites, Tawny, Fawny and Newborny, <laughs> in progressive sizes of smallness. <laughs> Newborny started to take his first hops right in front of me. Yeah, the mummy let her do that. I think she actually did it on purpose. Anyway, they actually moved forward. As I was coming to my cutie, they came closer. I couldn't believe it. It was really extraordinary because, I mean, I wasn't feeding them or anything, but I think the mother just wanted to show the kids that it was safe. Yeah. And sometimes this big male, because they have these, what do they call them, mobs of kangaroos, and they have one big male for like five or six different female families with kids, and uh, they really harass the women, of course, and <laughs> they all just try and get away from this male. And sometimes when that happened, they would all come towards the cootie, you know, just because they knew they were safer and probably wouldn't come too close. So this is what happens when we have a virtuous life, when we become gentle, when we become very harmless, you know. Other creatures pick that up, and it's beautiful. You feel so much more connected to life and to the world. And we do learn how to uh, live with one another in ways that are um, respectful and kind and generous, um, sharing our resources, sharing our spaces, even with the animals and birds. So from this virtue, of course, there's a lot of happiness there already, and we can bring that up with different reflections. But then we can go more deeply in the meditation because we have a sense of happiness already there. And this samadhi, this stillness, gives us a kind of very deep sense of inner resource. It's like we've got this wellspring of happiness that we can tap into any time. And amazingly, the more uh, we incline in that direction and get a taste for that sort of happiness of the mind, the more it tends to arise. I had an experience many years ago where um, <clears throat> there was a lot of happiness suddenly came up from, again, just noticing the peace that was there nothing special, but I looked at it suddenly with more appreciation and contentment and whoosh, it turned into incredible spiritual bliss, I guess. And uh, I remember going with it at the time and sometimes having the feeling, oh, it's a bit too much, and then it would, would withdraw. And then I'd let go into it again and it would kind of suffuse the whole body and mind. But then a few days later, or maybe even the next day, I sat down to meditate and the whole thing started to happen again, almost without me doing anything. And part of my mind was like, no, no, not now, or somehow mm, I haven't worked hard enough for it. I don't know what the subconscious psychology was, but what it showed me is that sometimes we resist that happiness. Sometimes we're not used to it and we actually... Um, haven't developed enough equanimity in the sense that we can invite it in. So this is really interesting because it does start to increase and we have to learn to be uh, skillful in the way that we handle it and also understand this is not um, a dangerous experience in any way. This is a kind of experience that is not for its own sake, but it's a sign that the hindrances are lessening and it's clearing the mind of... Um, of the things that make it dull, the things that make it tired, and enabling us to see into things more deeply. So there is, if you like, a responsibility inherent in these experiences in that we then use them for the greater good. Because in those experiences, the hindrances are temporarily set aside. But the wisdom factor of the path helps us to see the causes of those things in the first place. And that is the way to permanently overcome these tendencies we have to greed, uh, aversion, and delusion, most of all. So these are what are called in Tibetan traditions, and probably it's okay in Theravada too, the three poisons. 
often we call them the three root defilements or, you know, what I think about that word, defilements. <laughs> but these three things create all the problems in the world, you know. If we can get out of the storyline of the news that we see and the, you know, the conflicts and, oh my goodness, we were reading about Myanmar last night in uh, Mary Ann's wonderful book and um, just the political turmoil that country's been through since, I guess, the time of the British rule or you can't even call it rule, can you? Colonialism, like takeover, whatever. It's such a mess, you know, and if you get involved in all the nitty gritty, I mean, it sends your head spinning and there can be so much um, reason for resentment and, you know, factions and infighting and so many things, you know. But if you really look at what's underlying all of it, it's the greed, it's the aversion, it's the identification, isn't it, with my group, my religion, my people, you know, that causes so much pain for the, for the um, smaller minority groups, of which there are many in that country. Um, but really, the only way these can be addressed are by the practice that undermines these roots in our hearts. Um, and of course, you have to do a bit of both. You can't just all sit on a cushion until, you know, you're enlightened before <laughs> helping other people in this world. But we need to do both simultaneously. Otherwise, even really wonderful causes of activism and all the rest can lead to burnout. If we're not taking care of our mind, they can lead to the same qualities we condemn in others arising in our hearts. And I think we have to be very honest to that. There's no such thing in Buddhism as a just war. You know, war is war is war. And it goes on and on and on. You know, hate can only be overcome by love, never by hate. This is the eternal law, so said the Buddha. And I mean, we can feel that in our hearts. But the root cause of the, um, the greed and aversion is the delusion. And I think that's helpful for me to have more compassion when I see these things arise. It's because we really don't know what's going on. We really, um, our perceptions are distorted. So the word avidya is the opposite of vidya, which means wisdom. And that gives us clues to what wisdom is. <laughs> Um, avidya, the preface ah is like a negative, so it means no wisdom or not wisdom. Um, and to me, the opposite of that is not knowledge or it's not a, a ignorance or a lack of knowledge. It's, it's delusion. Wisdom is what sees, you know, and so many times in the suttas the, it talks about um, the eye of wisdom arising. It's that which sees clearly um, and sheds light on the world. Whereas a lack of knowledge or, or ignorance can be kind of overcome by learning, can't it? By understanding intellectually. But delusion is much deeper than that. It's actually taking things to be other than they are. So assuming a self where there's really just these five components of existence. You know, if you really look at what this whole experience of being alive consists of, you can bring it into five categories. There's body. There's feelings, mental and physical. There's perception, you know, we're aware of what we, we kind of, um, we label, we evaluate, we judge what we experience, right? I mean, we use labels to our experience to understand the world. And then there's um, sankara, the reacting part of the mind. This we can do something about because this is a whole heap of reactivity and kamma. This is where kamma is made, not so much in what we experience, but how we respond to that. And here we have a little bit of um, influence if we're fortunate to come in contact with the teachings and have some advice on um, learning to respond more wisely to life. And then there is, um, what's the next one? Sanya Sankara and Vinyana. That's it, right? Yeah. So Vinyana is the consciousnesses. And the Buddha said that these have to be understood as they really are, not as me and mine, but as causally arisen, things that arise and pass away. And all of us can see that to some extent, you know, if your body was really you, then the medicine you took, if you got the right medicine, would cure all the problems. And many of us here know that's not the case. And uh, I've been taking the food the best I can made with love, but still I have diarrhea this morning and this is just the nature of my tummy. <laughs> you know, this is just uh, beyond my control. So the Buddha always pointed out that these things uh, cannot be a self because if they were, we'd be able to say, may they be this way and not that way. 
but because we cannot say, may it be like this, may it not be like this, may I only have pleasant sensations, may I only have positive moods, may I never feel down, may I never get depressed, may I never feel pain in my body, then you could say that there's a self in there that's at the steering wheel, so to speak. But because these things cannot be done, and because of that they do lead to affliction, they do lead to pain, they cannot be a self. I mean, if a self was subject to suffering and affliction, would you really want to hold on to it? Would you really want to keep it? You know, um, it's the identification, isn't it, that makes it so much worse. We feel that, oh, it shouldn't be this way. I always think that word should is one of the enemies to, uh, to the truth. <laughs> because should is just some kind of idea that we impose on life. It's not the way things are. So we start to be able to open to these things. And of course, from the um, empowered mind that comes out of something like a jhana or even a mild state of peace or stillness, um, there's so much more stability and equanimity so that we can hold these experiences in mind and really look at them honestly without vested interests as to what we're going to find. And this is the kind of real free spirit of inquiry that the practice is trying to take us toward, that we really don't have a vested interest in what we're going to discover. We're real scientists, if you like, scientists of our own mind and body. And uh, we can look at things with fresh eyes. One of the things that um, Adrian Brown's taught me is that insight is not something you already know. Insight is something that surprises you, something that shocks you. Because it cuts away at more of this delusion. It's something we haven't seen before. And it's easy enough to see that craving and greed or um, maybe when lust arises in the mind or irritation arises in the mind, it's easy enough to see that, isn't it? But it's very, very hard to see delusion. If you can see delusion, you're not deluded, right? I mean, the very definition of delusion is that you're not seeing things. So a lot of the practice, especially before um, these deep meditations, is to start to uh, undermine these hindrances, have insight into the process of meditation, how to use our mind skillfully to uh, overcome some of the unwholesome habits of mind so that we can get these, this clear seeing, this capacity to really be true to our experience and see more deeply into it um, and understand how to still the mind. Yeah, This is also an aspect of wisdom, knowing the things that lead to wholesome states and the things that don't, and learning to adapt and adjust and use perception wisely. Yeah, There's a teacher in the insight scene who most people might know called Rob Berbier, and uh, he passed away a couple of years ago now. Yeah, And he um, sort of became famous for um, the way he'd frame this as ways of looking or ways of seeing. And uh, actually, this is in Buddhism from the very outset. And my own teacher has been teaching this for decades. He has whole talks on different ways of looking. And there's a lovely sutta in, uh, might be in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Giri Mananda Sutta. Uh, it should be in there because it's, I think, 11 things. So it might be in the chapter 11. Um, and it gives you 11 different types of perception that you can use to look at reality. One of them is, uh, I don't know if one of them's meta, but I always think it should be because meta is a perception and it's a very beautiful one. I think there is one about beauty, seeing beauty, and that's similar to meta because when we can see the goodness, the beauty in something, it's easy to have love. When we can have gratitude, it's easy to have love. Yeah, When we can be content with ourselves, with another, it's easier to have love. But uh, there's also the opposite, the asuba, which is what you didn't do and that's why... You're here because you, you know, not everybody disappeared last night because they were doing <laughs> contemplation on the disgusting nature of the body. <laughs> um, that's another contemplation, you know, just the, the kind of reality of the body. And then there are things like uh, the perception of the breath. Interesting that breath meditation is a perception. It's a particular way of looking at what's going on in this body and mind. Another one is um, non-delight in the whole world which might sound a bit negative, but honestly, when I hear these things, I feel so happy. Ajahn Chah had this beautiful phrase, and I think there's a photo of him somewhere, it goes, joy at last to know there's no happiness in the world. And he's got the biggest smile and he looks so free. 
because it's not that there's no happiness, but it's that there's even more happiness somewhere else. You know, there's even more happiness than we've got any clue about yet. That's why when it comes up, you're like, whoa, <laughs> don't know about this. Because <laughs> we're so used to our suffering, we're so attached to it. And another of those perceptions is the perception of impermanence, which is one that I've used for many, many years. And um, before the deep meditation, it's possible to get a lot of wisdom through this practice. We can work, as Goenkaji used to call it, at the level of sensation, which means basically observing our bodily sensations to see that they're changing all the time. You know, what we call pain is actually just a whole mass of different sensations like pressure or piercing feelings or heat or um, throbbing, pulsing, etc. So when we can start to break it down, it actually becomes quite interesting rather than, um, you know, so, so much of a problem anymore. But when we label it as pain and we have our habitual response, you know, there's no gap where we see that choice of responding or reacting. Then we immediately go, I don't want this, you know, I have to move, I have to do something about it, take a pill, which I actually did at the recommendation of someone else <laughs> this morning because I had a headache. Uh, but um, if we can really get into this observation it becomes quite fascinating and we start to see that all the sensations in the body whether we think of them as pleasant or unpleasant are changing they're subject to change not only will they change they are changing every moment and um, for me personally what 10 14 years of practice in this method teaching not teaching serving and sitting on well, over a hundred retreats altogether, which is a bit embarrassing to say because I'm not enlightened yet, but <laughs> but it was great for continuity. And uh, this was mostly in India and Nepal and Myanmar and all across the world. And um, yeah, just getting so much equanimity through that practice and so much um, ability to stay with the unpleasant as well as the pleasant and in a sense take responsibility for that. So, you know, you become so sensitive to the, to the feelings that are arising at any given time that say someone approaches you with maybe anger or, or whatever, you, I would feel the reaction in my body. I would feel a kind of slight tensing, but at the same time, I'd feel it just changing and dissolving right there and then. And because I could stay with that, I wasn't projecting it on the person and I wasn't reacting to it. So I could meet that person with such a, a strong sense of presence of mind and receptivity without judging. And of course, the whole thing could de-escalate that way. So these were some of the very obvious benefits of that practice. But um, after many years of practice and also four years in Myanmar as a Buddhist nun, um, meditating a lot, continu continuously really, even through the night quite often because when the mindfulness gets stronger, you can't really go to sleep. Um, so sometimes I wished I could actually, but uh, a lot of the time that wasn't coming. Uh, and it got to the place where I could really see very clearly that everything was changing all the time at very high velocity. And yet something was missing. Something was missing in the sense of not being clear enough about the causes as to why these things arose. And it was easy enough to see that things change. But the insight into how, the causality, was still not clear to me. And that was one of the reasons that um, Ajahn Brahm's teachings made such, had such an impact, because he was talking about getting into deeper meditation to have more penetration, like more mental capacity to see much more clearly how things arise. And uh, one of my teachers in Burma at the time said, oh, it's like before the jhanas, before the deep samadhi, you've got a knife, but it's blunt and it takes a long time to cut through, say, I don't know, a potato or carrot or something hard. But when you have um, deep meditation or when the mind's been empowered by those things, it's not you have it, right? This is a really bad way of speaking about practice, which we often do. Oh, you have this, I have that. No, we don't have it. But we might experience uh, deeper or, or, or lighter levels of samadhi from time to time. Um, so with that, when the mind is clear, when the mind is bright and strong, it's like having a very sharp knife that can just cut through this delusion, basically. Uh, in this case, a carrot. Um, much more easily. 
Yeah. So um, each factor of this path supports the next, and it's good to practice at every level. <clears throat> but I think um, in this particular sequence, the Buddha's talking about samadhi being the cause for seeing things as they are, being the cause for wisdom. And that corresponds as well with the Anapanasati Sutta, the Sutta on the mindfulness of breathing. Um, we talked a bit about that already, about the first stage, which is watching the breath coming in and out. I'm very much um, condensing it here, but the first tetrad, which is four different instructions, is uh, seeing the breathing, basically. The second one focuses on the joy. The third one focuses on the mental aspect of that breath. And the fourth one, leading to the jhanas, basically. Vimochayam chitta means the mind liberated from the hindrances, liberated from the five senses in jhana. <clears throat> and uh, there's different interpretations of that, but the Pali scholars will, who've studied the texts in depth say that vimochayam or vimoka always refers to jhanas. So vimochayam is like a, I don't know, would it be a paspotispo? Better not get into grammar. But um, the mind that is freed is the mind in deep samadhi. And then the last um, stage of this breath meditation is to develop insight. So again, it's the insight dependent on these deep meditations. And that can clearly see into um, impermanence, suffering and non-self. And in this particular sutta, it even breaks it down. This is again the Upanissa Sutta. It breaks that down into um, the five aggregates of existence or components. Such is form, that means the body, materiality. Such is its origin, causality. Such is its passing away. So it's not just the arising and passing, it's the origin, why these things arise. Such is feeling, such is its origin, such is its passing away. Such is perception, such is its origin, such is its passing away. Such are volitional formations or the reactive part of the mind, such is consciousness, such is its origin, such is its passing away. Even consciousness has an origin and it passes away. Momentarily, at the speed of light, really, probably faster, I don't know, but very fast. Very, very fast. And with that kind of depth of um, stillness in the mind, it's actually possible to start seeing this happen. And, uh, and of course, then it becomes very almost impossible to take these things as a self because you can see that they're just arising based on causes. So when it says such is its uh, form, such is form or whatever, such is its origin, such is its passing away, it just means we know it as it is. And we know that it's happening without an agent. There's no one at the controls. You know, these things are coming into being and disappearing when those causes are removed. I don't know if this sounds weird, but to me this sounds kind of like scientific and sort of, I don't know. Does this sound too deep and hard to understand or? No, that's good. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, the thing is, again, with wisdom, it's not intellectual. It's something that has to be experienced. So we can... Yeah, it's good to get an intellectual grasp of how to look, where to look, what we might find. But again, wisdom itself is something that's uh, an experience. And a measure of wisdom is the way it transforms one's life. So if it's a real insight, it should lead to more peace with yourself, with others in your relationships. It should lead to very strong virtue. Because why would you create suffering unnecessarily when you understand how suffering arises, where it comes from? Yeah, it becomes almost impossible to do something intentional to hurt another. And I'm sure everybody already is at that point. You know, I mean, sometimes we slip up. Of course we do. We know we're going to say something that's not super skillful, but we just say it anyway because we've got some kind of, you know, aversive energy in us or some suffering that we're not really managing too well. But on the whole, you know, uh, wisdom has to start manifesting in our daily life. There are some kind of people that I won't mention by name, but, you know, there's even a book by someone, a lay person, who on the front claims to be fully enlightened. And the book then goes on to discuss how he's fully enlightened, so he can say for certain that when you're fully enlightened, anger's still there. 
So first you have to presume they're fully enlightened and then you judge <laughs> the behavior. It's much more important to get a sense of what it really means and then you decide whether you know, somebody's really free from uh, unwholesome states or not. And uh, I have met people who've been around that particular person and they say he's highly agitated, which is very sad because it's not about gauging where people are at or, you know, getting into this attainment or that attainment. It's about relieving suffering. And if someone's enlightened but they suffer, what the hell is the point, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what's the point? And if you're not living a virtuous life, what's the point? I mean, if we can't bring more loving kindness, more compassion into the world, what does enlightenment matter? It's not enlightenment. It's, it's worthless, isn't it? Isn't it? I kind of think it is. I mean, good for that person. But... Um, don't come too close <laughs> if you're not coming with compassion. So, um, yeah, wisdom must have its transformative effect and it must be gradually integrated into our lives. And for this as well, wise friendship is so key. So um, I think I'm a bit all over the place, but um, I'm feeling kind of, maybe it's that paracetamol, I feel quite clear. <laughs> but I just wanted to say as well that um, metta, yeah, it's all about the paracetamols. Forget it's Marty. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I only had one, but I don't normally have them. Anyway, <laughs> I just wanted to finish soon by saying that meta meditation also has very beautiful benefits in terms of deepening our wisdom. And uh, one of these, as I hinted at already, is the insight into how our perception changes our reality, basically. I'm sure everyone here has experienced times when they wake up and the mind is really brittle, really contracted. Like I woke up a bit like that today because I didn't sleep well at all last night and I felt really like, oh, I can't think clearly or anything. And, uh, and then I, I looked at my life in a bit of a negative way. Oh, I don't think now's the right time to get into a big monastery. I'm exhausted. I'm done for. I've been doing this for eight years. Ugh. You know, where's my teacher when I need him? He's not replying to me. And... and I mean, I'm wise enough to know that that's because I haven't slept too well and the mind is not very resourced. But when it is, and when there's metta, and when there's a sense of ease and well-being in the mind, oh, the whole past looks so different, doesn't it? Oh, this had to happen to get us to where we were. It doesn't matter how hard I work. It doesn't matter. You know, this is benefiting so many people and I'm growing spiritually. I could have never been up here with these funny microphones and given a talk in the past and now I've got the chance to help so many people. You know, you, we see it so differently because we're seeing through a different lens and our mind is big. In the suttas there's this beautiful um, sutta called, what's it called in Pali? Low something. Anyway, Lona something. The salt crystal. I'm sure some of you might know it. It's really beautiful. And it's about how kamma or how basically thoughts, perceptions arise depending on your state of mind now. And it says that um, if you have a salt crystal uh, and you put it in a glass of water, that water is basically undrinkable, right? So that salt crystal is like the negative thinking or even the pain in the body, right? The disease, whatever. <clears throat> and you put it in a salt crystal, uh, in, a, in a glass, which is like a small mind, there's not a lot of water there and it becomes so salty and just you can't go near that water. But if you put that same crystal into a big lake, then you don't even taste the salt at all. In fact, maybe it's actually, you know, improves its nutritional content. I don't know. Um, and that is like the mind resourced with metta. So that's why in the suttas it says a mind with samadhi, whether through whatever means, you know, a mind that's... Um, become still is mahagata gone to greatness it's big it's boundless it's wide and these states of loving kindness are called the boundless states apamana which means measureless states no measure they just go on and on and on and they include all beings including oneself including one's negativities but they hardly have an impact when the mind's full of metta when the mind is resourced so even if somebody does come toward you with you know sharp words in the suttas it says um verbal daggers i love that verbal daggers with words like verbal daggers because it's like that isn't it it cuts it can really cut the heart and sometimes we use it to cut people we've got this i think another place in the suttas it says it's like we've got a sword in our tongue so we have to be so careful mm. <laughs> get a soft tongue through lots of meta practice and uh 
it doesn't really have much impact if we're feeling really at ease. In fact, we might be more likely to respond with compassion, understanding that person struggling right now. So this is how the samadhi states really help. And the metta can also be used to, um, I guess the main difference between uh, Buddhist practice and understanding of these samadhi states is that they're not the end of the path. So even though they might feel like unconditional love or union with God or... I don't know, love, it's usually felt as as love or just immense peace and something otherworldly, as I said before in this retreat. The Buddha's teaching is that that is not the end. They, those states are still conditioned. They're still arisen through causes. And they're not the end of the path, which is good. It doesn't take anything away from those things, but it means there's yet a deeper happiness beyond. And it's from there, if we can understand that these states are still conditioned, they're not mine. It's not like I have lots of metta or, you know, this samadhi state is who I really am. All the other stuff, that's someone else. That's not my fault. <laughs> but this is who I really am. I'm feeling like myself today. We always say that, don't we? I'm feeling like myself. I'm not feeling like myself because we don't like that part. But, you know, none of it is us. None of it's who we are. And they're not permanent. So we can reflect like that. After these samadhi states, we can reflect on what brought them into being and the fact that they are um, a temporary overcoming of the unwholesome states of mind. And that's wonderful because it's weakening the roots. But the Buddha said the very highest happiness is the happiness of wisdom, even higher than the happiness of peace. Of course, it is a very peaceful state to have wisdom, there is peace, but it's happier than those conditioned states because there's no more greed and hate and delusion there. Of course, for most of us, there's plenty, but we can feel the happiness of having a clear mind or, you know, coming gradually out of those things. And other people can certainly feel it when we're less angry, angry and less um, greedy, less selfish, you know, more considerate of other people. And uh, the highest happiness of all is actually Nibbana, you know, something beyond any conditioned state. And I'm not going to try and put words to that because... Even people who've experienced it cannot put words because simply it is beyond anything we can understand through these five senses or um, components of existence who we think we are. But the Buddha said, Nibbanam paramam sukham. It means it's the highest happiness, the highest happiness of all and uh, far beyond anything we can comprehend. So I wanted to end this talk by um, reading out a little verse that talks about what Nibbana is and this is from the Majjhima Nikaya number 64 uh, chapter no it's like a paragraph paragraph 8 this is peaceful this is sublime that is the stilling of all formations Sabe Sankara Samatha again this Samatha the relinquishing of all acquisitions giving things up, the destruction of craving, dispassion or fading, cessation, nibbana. So this is about the ending of things as opposed to the arising of new things and the peace when things start to fade. So hopefully we can experience some of that peace today by getting more into our meditation and uh, seeing the beauty in ending as well. Seeing the beauty even in the end of a retreat, that we've done something beautiful together and really making the most of the time we have left. So I think that is plenty. And uh, shall we have a little stretch and then do some meditation? I'm a little bit curious as to, uh, sorry about the Zoom folks, I can't see feedback, but uh, I just wonder, because people do get a lot of benefit from metta. Is there any particular wish to continue with some sort of metta or, 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 <laughs> or something else? I don't know. Okay, who likes the metta? Okay, I'll set you off with that and then you'll see where it goes. And then the invitation is also to just notice as we scan through the body, the change, the changing nature of all these sensations. And of course, with the metta, you can also 
see how it changes over the course of the practice. Usually it's better with samadhi practice to uh, do a reflection at the end rather than analyze it too much at the time. So, But we'll, uh, you're invited to notice change. <clears throat> yeah, probably metta's good too because many of us are going to see our families. <laughs> they need metta, right? <laughs> As we sit together, just establishing a perception of being with spiritual friends. Feeling into your own body, but also into the space around you. And the silent company of your fellow travelers on this retreat. Even if you're on the Zoom, the impression of everyone else in their little screens, in their cozy homes, supporting you with their spiritual friendship, their inclination towards the path. How worthy, how noble is that? And you're one of these people with the same noble intentions, the same beautiful qualities of heart, really taking a moment to appreciate that in yourself and in the others whom we're here with now. And with that sense of gladness, appreciation, even gratitude, bringing that beautiful, grateful, friendly awareness to your body, to your dear body that works so hard for you. your lungs that keep on breathing without any command, your brain that's so tired, allowing it to turn down those signals, those channels that are constantly on the go. shoulders and arms, busy fingers now having chance to relax. And your torso again, the lungs breathing, 
the heart beating. The tummy holding. So many emotions. Allowing this kindful awareness to caress each and every part of your body. To express its appreciation and give your body permission to relax. Noticing any sensations that arise. Noticing the transitory nature of them. Arising just to pass away. Not me, not mine, not a self. So let them be. Moving down the back, exploring every area of your back. Giving caring attention to all those little muscles. Perhaps again, the organs inside, right down to your hips, your buttocks. Noticing maybe different sensations over there. Constantly changing. And perhaps you can notice how they're influenced by the disposition of your mind, how kindness helps relax and soften the sensations in the body. Feeling into your knees. Maybe many different sensations in your knees. And down your legs the shins, the calves, to the ankles, the heels, the soles, and the toes. Giving attention to each little toe. Caring, kind attention. Just feeling the whole body sitting. Allowing your awareness to expand and just receive any sensations that manifest right now. Anywhere in your body. 
maybe the body as a whole. Noticing how your experience is constantly changing. Nothing to worry about, nothing to cling to, just allowing experience to arise and pass away. Perhaps noticing that as your body and your mind settle down, there's an increasing sense of peace, stillness, stability. And connecting with any feelings that are fairly mild, pleasant, easeful. As once again, if you wish, we can bring the loved person to mind. See who arises in your mind naturally. And see how you respond. If there's a sense of connection, goodwill, And this may be a good person to practice metta with right now. Or if more complicated emotions arise, then perhaps choose someone else who you can picture in front of your mind's eye or get a sense of their presence, how it feels to be around them. Someone who gladdens your heart and mind. Or if you wish, it can even be yourself that's what feels good for you right now. If you feel in need of your own loving kindness, and there's a sense of tenderness and warmth, So whether for a loved one or a friend, or for you yourself, see what phrases come to mind, some simple, beautiful wishes for your own or another's benefit. And offer these with sincerity and warmth, 
staying connected to your own heart area or any place in the body that feels at ease. And listening in those spaces between each phrase to allow the mind to incline in the direction of loving kindness towards the emotional felt sense of what that word really means. Keeping the mind soft, gentle, receptive, and patient without making any demands, just giving, loving for the sake of giving and expressing your love. And noticing the beauty of an ever-increasing sense of peace. As the mind settles into the metta, or perhaps allows those phrases to disappear and settles with the breath. So see what works for you right now. And enjoy the practice. Practicing just to give, to renounce, to share the goodness of your life.
So for those who wish to come out of this sitting meditation and move into some walking, we can reflect before we end. So once again, just bringing this person, if you're meditating with metta, bringing them to mind or connecting with yourself. And wishing this person well, saying goodbye with a smile. And bringing that same attitude of loving kindness towards your own body and mind once again. Noticing how you feel. If there is a little more peace in the mind, how that manifests in the body as a felt experience, perhaps around the chest or a general sense of ease. Maybe more pleasant sensation, maybe a lessening of some pain or disease. Maybe not, and that's okay. But just see if you can notice the ease in the mind relative to when you began. The peace, the happiness of things quietening down. Letting go of burdens. Becoming more still. See if you can value whatever peace and contentment you experience now, however modest, <coughs> however humble it seems. And determine to value and guard that peace <coughs> by continuing to develop beautiful states of mind, mindfulness, stillness, kindness, whatever works for you. So staying connected with your body. And if you are moving into the walking meditation, keeping that peace inside. Continuing to build mindfulness throughout the day, whatever you do even on the toilet or having your tea. So, again, I won't ring the bell because some of you may wish to stay here and continue practicing sitting or lying. And for others, there's half an hour of walking practice. So, um, uh, do people want a bell at 12 o'clock or no? No, lovely. So no bell, silence. And uh, I think again we'll probably have an optional sitting period from 1 till 1.30 in here. So uh, it's optional, so take all the space you need. And I'll be back at half past one. So please enjoy each moment of practice.